So the, we are going to start today with Antigone. Uh, I better not uh, try to pronounce her second name. All I want to say is that your side, slide is not there. I'll just, yeah, you will know the reason if you see the second name. <laughs> and all I want to say is that uh, <clears throat> people shouldn't just uh, <clears throat> blame uh, South Indians for complicated second name. Uh, jokes apart, she is a rising star uh, in, in our community, the crypto community, and uh, she is the youngest cryptography lead uh, bracket uh, vice president at uh, JP Morgan um, AI Research. And uh, before joining JP Morgan, she completed her postdoctorate from Cornell. And, uh, uh, and even before that, she completed her PhD from Aarhus University. Um, and this is why I like Aarhus. It gave me a lot of friends uh, in our community. And uh, today, she is going to enlighten us on a very trendy topic of uh, uh, federated learning via secure multi-party computation, and uh, which has already a lot of local interest at IAC and also in Bangalore. So with that, I would like to welcome Antigone for the talk. Yeah, thank you. Please go on. So thanks, Arpita, for a nice introduction. I'm very happy to be here, even though I'm jet lagged. But we will make it to the talk. So this is a talk about uh, federated learning. It's like uh, some new, uh, uh, you don't hear me? OK. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the new work we have on federated learning. And at the beginning, it's going to be like a, a talk about introducing federated learning. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about our new results. And this is a joint work with uh, with Tucker, David, and, and Vike. So Vike, he was an intern with us at JP Morgan, and Dave, he was a JP Morgan PhD fellow for the summer. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so with federated learning, what we can do, actually we can uh, compute a global uh, model based on the data of individual users, such that this data, they don't leave the devices of the users, okay? And this is all managed by a central uh, server. So just to be more specific, so here is the setting. So we have a server who sits in the middle. And then this server in the first step, let's say it initializes some model. This is usual, like it happens usually in machine learning. So we start with a model. So then it sends this model to the different mobile devices. And then these mobile devices, uh, they train locally on their data. So imagine that we're running some logistic regression, some neural net computation, you name it. So they train locally on their data. So the data doesn't leave their computers. And they come up with their local model, OK? Then they send the updates of this model uh, to the server in the middle. So here I have them like with colors. So these are the, the new local models. So they send these models to the middle server. So the server actually computes an average model based on this model. So just think for now that, let's say, this is logistic regression. And the users are setting the weights of the logistic regression. And basically, once the server receives all the weights, it computes the weighted average of all these weights. And this is the new model, okay? the updated model. Okay, So it's very simple. So it receives all the weights, local weights from the users. It aggregates them, it gets the average, and this is the new model. Okay? So, and in the next step, it sends this new updated model back to the users. And the users keep training on this model. Okay? So basically, we keep repeating this process till the model converges. Okay, so this is in a high level, the setting of federated learning. And the idea here is that the data doesn't leave uh, the mobile devices. It stays there. So we train locally, and we only send the model parameters to the middle server. Okay? And let's talk about uh, numbers. So usually, like, what's the population size? So the number of mobile devices can, be, can start with 1 million and go, like, to billions. And in every... Uh, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what is done. So you are choosing uh, a set of, uh, of mobile devices. So in every iteration, you don't take all these 1 million users. You take a subset of them, yes. And here, yeah, so you see that like, usually it's 50. Yeah, so usually it's 50 between like 5,000. 
So if you have 1 million users, you usually pick 50 to 5,000 in every iteration, and you pick different set every time. So basically this depends on which devices are online, like which devices have batteries, so it, it also depends on the connectivity, which devices the middle server is going to select. And I didn't come up with these numbers myself, so actually there was a workshop recently where they have a report, and this workshop happened at Google. So actually it's a very nice paper if you want to have a look. They have like all the open challenges and federated learning. So they report these numbers over there. And this is for mobile uh, networks. So you can also use federated learning between hospitals or other organizations. So there these numbers are much smaller. So it's not millions of devices. It's usually like, it's no more than like 5,000. Okay? But in this talk, we are focusing on uh, this cross-device federated learning where we have millions of users. And here are the different models that you can also have in federated learning. So first of all, okay, so its device can compute uh, the model locally without communicating with anybody else. So you're based only on your local model. Then we have this centralized model that I just uh, showed you. Then another thing that you can do is that you're only talking with your neighbors. So you're trying to build the model only with your neighbors. So you're communicating only with your neighbors. And then there's another one where you're still communicating with your neighbors, but from time to time, you're also talking with your global network. Okay, so these are the two different, actually four different settings that you can have. And we're going to focus on this one. And usually, if you think about it, so like, uh, for example, Google started this federated learning. So it, it made more sense that Google is a single server, right? So if we say, okay, we're splitting, we have this servers to be two servers, then you have to trust Google that has two servers, okay? So it makes sense to have only a single server here. Okay, so we're gonna focus on this setting. Uh, no, no, uh, you, so when I say trust, I mean you are gonna send your weights encrypted, so we're gonna see this later. But if you have like, let's say you have two servers where you're, where you're sending your data, it's still encrypted. If they both belong to like Google, then if they come together, then you're losing all the secrecy. That's what I meant. Because usually when you have like two servers or three, you can have more efficient secure computation protocols because you use secret setting and it's, everything is blazing fast. But here, you're stuck with one server, so you cannot use secret setting in the usual uh, sense. So there's something else which is called split learning. So I want to say what's the difference here. So in federated learning, as I said, the mobile devices, they compute the local model on their own machine. Okay. And uh, this can be any model, okay? And the idea is that you just like send the parameters of the model and then the parameters are aggregated and then you, send, you get back the new update. And this can be a neural net or anything. So there's the split learning where actually what they're doing, so think of a neural net. So they are uh, splitting the neural net in layers as it's usual. And actually they assign every different layer to different clients. So let's say we have a neural net that has many layers. So we are splitting, uh, every layer belongs only to one client. Okay, so it's like a, a horizontal partition. Okay, and why is this better than like the federated learning? So in some scenarios, not all, it turns out that this uh, split learning is more efficient in terms of communication compared to federated learning. Because what you can do in split learning is that, let's say we have a large database so you can split the data across these uh, different clients. So let's say we have one million data and we have two clients. We're gonna split this one million to half million and half million between the clients. In federated learning, you won't be able to do that. So if a client has uh, one million uh, or 10 million data, they have to use them. You cannot split them across the parties. Okay, so this is efficient only if you can divide the data across the different clients. And because you're doing that, you have less communication going on. Okay? And you would think, so let's say here I put only one layer, so here you have one client, but imagine that you could have more clients on the top till you reach at the end. But if you have a neural net and you want to actually train it, it turns out that, let's say there's another client here, so let's say it finishes its own level, and then it needs to send the updates to the next client, okay? And you need to do this uh, for every example that you have. Okay, so this is, you would think that this is not efficient because in neural nets you will have like, when you train, you need to go down to the output level to keep going, okay? So it's not enough that you keep training your first segment on multiple data and then you're done. You really need to go down all the way. You need this, to do this back propagation and all this stuff. So you really need to go all the way down. 
and you have to do this per example or a batch of examples. So you would think that this has more communication, right? Because you need to go every time all the way down and if you have many clients here, the clients will have to communicate and talk to the server. But in, they have a scenario where basically uh, you're putting the server in the middle. So you have client server, client server, client server. So everybody only talks to the server. And then they split the levels in such a way that uh, you don't need to have a lot of communication. And as I said before, you're dividing the data across the different devices. Okay, so that's why in some scenarios this is useful and actually it's only useful if you have a lot of data. So federated learning is much faster if you don't have huge amounts of data. Uh, but if you have a lot, then only split learning is faster. But if you don't have a lot of data, then uh, split, uh, federated learning is better. Okay, so just to show you the differences here. Just remember from this slide that if you have huge amount of data, maybe split learning is going to be more efficient. So actually, uh, here I have some applications and uh, these things are used in, in real, so on your phone. For example, Google is using this for the Gboard mobile keyboard. So basically what they do, so when you are typing something, uh, they give you usually some suggestion on what is the next word or what is the current word that you are typing. So to do that, uh, they're using federated learning. So they're using your mobile uh, phones to find out the suggestions, okay? And they have it also on Pixel phone and some other features and some uh, messaging. Then Apple is also using it for like uh, their own keyboard. Uh, and also they are using it for some classification at uh, Siri. Then there's also another company that they are using it for medical research. I don't know exactly the setting, so don't ask me. Uh, and then we have uh, a lot of systems for federated learning. So most of them, they're like open source. Some of them you can actually change and use, some of them you cannot. Uh, and actually there's, um, there's an issue with simulation. So let's say you, are, you want to write a paper in federated learning and you want to like uh, give the experimental analysis. So let's say you need to run these experiments across 5,000 uh, mobile devices. Let's say you're doing this on Amazon, so you need to open like 5,000 diff different instances on Amazon. So basically we need to have some form of simulation to do that. And there's like a new framework, which is called LEAF, where you can do some things there. And they also provide some specific data sets to test for federated learning. And we also have a new simulation framework where basically you can also say on which uh, part of the world the devices can be. So it also simulates latency and all of this stuff. I'm going to come back to this later. Okay. And in general, so these were applications in the real world. And in general, you can think for any recommendation system that you want to have. You can use federated learning. So recently, uh, you can also like use it for fraud detection. Nobody is using it yet in real, but uh, it can be possible, right? You have the different banks and you want to like test for fraud detection. So the applications uh, are many and it's also used uh, in the real world. So there's a lot of um, uh, interest in federated learning. Okay, so here I have some challenges. So there's this big challenge about the data. So if the data are identically distributed, then the model can converge faster. But in many cases, the data is not really identically distributed. Okay, so maybe like I don't know, like the phones in China, they follow some different distribution on the data from the phones in the US. So you can have these scenarios where the data is not the same. And there are different words that tackle this problem when the data is not identically distributed. I'm not going to like talk about these techniques, but there's a lot of research on that. And there are still many problems on how to treat uh, non-identical data. Then there's the issue of unbalanced data. So let's say some mobile phones, they have tons of data and some other phones, they don't have a lot of data. So this is also a problem on how you can find the best way to converge to the final model. Then there's this other setting where actually uh, it's called vertical and horizontal partitioning. So what this means is that uh, when we are training, we are assuming that it's by example, so that all the devices, they have examples and they all share the same features, okay? Uh, but horizontal means, actually vertical means that they don't have all the same features. So let's say some mobile devices have like some specific set of features, another one has some other set of features. So this is like harder to train because they have different features. They don't all have the same features. So this is another uh, setting. 
And then the other important thing is that uh, even when you do the federated learning, as we said before, so you need to like select some subset uh, of the mobile uh, devices, but still they can drop off. These are mobile phones and you know, like maybe your battery is gone while you're training. So you really need to have a protocol that accommodates uh, clients that they can drop at any point in the computation. Okay, so these are different settings. And there's another one uh, about uh, the bias in selection of the clients. And I'm gonna talk actually more about that. And our work also focuses a lot on that. So I'm gonna come back to this. So that was high level, the setting of federated learning. And I'm gonna show you now like uh, some methods, like high level methods uh, that they're used for federated learning. So one method will be using differential privacy and then we will see why it's not enough and why you need uh, to combine differential privacy and secure computation together. So I'm going to give you now a high level of this. So in many papers, actually what they do, so as I said before, so here they have their weights. And as, as I said before, they're sending their weights to the server. Okay, so there's a lot of work that says actually if you send just the weights, you can go back to the training data, especially if the model is linear. I mean, if I sent you the weights, you can very easily go back to the data. Okay, so what they do, they add some noise to the weights, okay? So, and this comes from differential privacy, so I'm gonna define it quickly for you. If you have any question, like, just talk to me. Uh, so what differential privacy says, so let's say we are like uh, in this room and Arpita leaves the room, okay? Let's say, and let's say that she's smoking. I'm not sure if you're smoking, but assume that she's smoking. And let's say she was the only smoker in the room, okay? So now we have uh, a database where our names are there, all our names are there, and then we have another database without Arpita, okay? So now we should not be able to distinguish that Arpita was the one that was the, the smoker, okay? Even if she left the room, we should not be able to say that, okay? So this is what uh, is differentially uh, privacy about. So if we have two different data sets, that differ in one location or like in one entry, one user, then we shouldn't be able to distinguish uh, which user has this feature, okay? So this is differential privacy and actually here you are hiding a property of the user. You are not hiding a property of the whole data set. For example, here we will know the distribution of the users. We will know that there's one user that smokes but we don't know who is this user. But we still leak this information that there's one person that is smoking. Okay, so we're not hiding the distributions. If we want to hide distributions, then we can use encryption and we're hiding everything. So here it's about privacy of an individual person. And let me define it slightly uh, more formally. So the common setting is that we have the database and we have like uh, a user here and we have a server that is asking queries uh, to, the, um, to the user. For example, it says, okay, compute f of, f of x for me. And then the user comes back with the answer, but add some noise, okay? So you don't really get the actual answer, but you get the noisy answer. And we say that the mechanism uh, is uh, epsilon differentially private. If for all, uh, actually for all pairs of data sets, X and Y, uh, that differ in one location, as I said before, and for all types of events, so the probability of seeing the same event, if we are in the database X, is almost the same as uh, seeing this event when we are having the data set Y, okay? So this epsilon here is very small. And here, just to um, give you a better understanding of the definition, so I can write this uh, in a more explainable way. So let's say if the epsilon is like small, let's say if it's zero, then the, there's no noise. So then the two distributions are the same. Okay, so epsilon is usually small. Epsilon actually defines the privacy loss. And in general, what you should keep in mind is that the more noise that you're adding to your system, the less accurate the results are, okay? So depending on the application, you have to decide what is your parameter epsilon and how much accuracy you want. So there's a trade-off. And also here, for example, there's also this privacy budget. So let's say the server is asking many queries uh, to the user there's a limit on how many times we can ask uh, the user because uh, if you like if he answers and he adds noise you need to increase the amount of noise so if you fix your noise from the beginning after some point if you keep asking him many many times then basically you can remove all the noise and find everything about the data set so there are also these restrictions you need to say how many times you can query 
the data set. Okay, and all of this is based on the parameter epsilon and your privacy budget. Okay, so this is at the high level. What is differential privacy about? Um, do you have any questions about differential privacy? So basically just keep in mind that we are adding noise to hide properties of individual users. We're not hiding distributions of the large population. Okay. So as I said before, so we can add noise to our weights. However, there are still some attacks. So even if you add noise to your weights, after some time, you can still go back to the data. And actually, there are more sophisticated attacks. It's not after some time. They are doing some clever things where even if you have the differential private uh, weight, you can still go back to the training data. Okay. So this is not satisfying. Okay, so we don't like differential privacy here, so let's use encryption. So let's encrypt the weights, okay? So this is the next suggestion. So instead of using differential privacy, let's encrypt the weights. So every user now encrypts the weights and then they send uh, the encrypted weights to the um, server. And the server computes a secure aggregation, actually weighted average on the weights, and it comes up with uh, actually the weighted average, okay? So here I think that uh, we are using a secure aggregation protocol where the server gets all the aggregated, uh, sorry, all the updates encrypted. It computes on the encrypted data and gets the answer in the clear. Okay? Yeah. Huh? Sorry? Ah, ah previous slide. Yes. So there are these papers here that they have some attacks and there are some more recent attacks about that. So you also had uh, some question? Yeah, so I'm gonna, uh, so the parties have their own key and I'm gonna show you how you can do this in one round, with some secure aggregation in one round. And you can also do it using additive form of encryption where it's actually a two round protocol then. I'm gonna come to that later. Yeah, that's uh, the next slide, yes, <laughs> yes. You are ahead of me. So let's go to the next slides. Okay, so now we encrypted everything. There's still an attack here, okay? So what happens here is, okay, encryption does its job, so the weights are encrypted. But actually here, we are computing the weighted average. So we are seeing the output of the secure computation. So just looking at the output, we can still infer the weights of some other parties if we have collusions. Okay, so let's say now if n minus one parties, if like three out of the four parties collude, then they can find the weight of the other person. Okay, so just to make it more explicit, here uh, they are the encrypted weights and we, we are adding them in a secure way and we are getting out the result. So if these three collude, then they know their own weights, right? So they can subtract them out from the final answer and find out the weight of this person. Okay, and I have here, just forget about federated learning, I have a simple example to illustrate that. So let's say I'm gonna do for you secure aggregation using secret sharing, it's very simple. So how we can do it, so everybody secret shares his input. So C shares X1, he shares X2, uh, X3 and X4, so we have four different parts. Okay, these are the shares of the secret sharing. And they are sending the shares to the other parties. This is the simplest protocol ever. So from the first party sends the other three shares to the other three parties. The second one keeps uh, uh, Vita 2 for himself and shares to the other parties and so on. Okay, so everybody gets one share of the input. Then what they can do, they can add these shares that they have. Okay, then they broadcast M1, M2, M3 and M4. And if you get these values, you can add them up and get the sum of uh, of the inputs, right? So let's say here we were computing uh, the sum of our ages, okay? So now we all see the sum of our ages and let's say these three come together. Uh, so if they come together, they can subtract their own age from the final output. So let's say the age was 100. This is, and then like we were all 20 years old, okay? Uh, not 25 years old. So then, if we three come together, we subtract our age and we find the fourth person is 25 years old, okay? Super simple example. And the idea here is that, okay, secure computation is great, you can hide the inputs, but you are revealing the output and the output sometimes can leak information about the inputs, right? 
So that's um, the idea here. Okay, so let's try to see if we can hide the output. Uh, if we have collisions, right? If nobody colludes with nobody, then we are okay. But let's see what happens under collusions. So let's use uh, differential privacy for the output, okay? So as Kermit was saying before. So now we're doing uh, this uh, complex setting here. So we're encrypting and also adding noise to our weights. So we're doing both of the things at the same time. Okay? And then we are getting, uh, again, our uh, uh, average. But the average has this noise because we added some noise in the weights, right? So, yeah. Can a client and model collude? Can a client what? Can a client and the global model owner, can they collude? Yes. Actually, I have some motivation to tell you uh, later why collusions are important and why it's possible to have collusions. I'll come back to that in a while. Okay? So, you're getting now the weight but with some noise. Okay? So, let's see now. What is the type of attack that you can have here? So we reduce the set of attacks, but let's see what attacks still remain. So what you can do, so now again, so if the three parties come together, they can find uh, this party's weight plus the noise that this party added. So let's say again, that if that was the example for the ages that we had. So let's say I was, I'm here and let's say uh, I was like 30 years old, but you don't see that I'm 30, you see 30 plus some noise because I added noise to my weight, right? So let's say this noise shows that I'm between 20 to 40, an example. So it says that I'm 35 or something like that. So you cannot really come close to my edge because there's this noise over there. Okay? So you're still leaking that and you would think, okay, I mean, this is like the best you can do. You cannot really like uh, change that. Of course, you can increase the noise. Okay? So if I increase the noise that I'm adding to my input, if I increase it a lot, then of course I'm hiding my edge better. But then the model is not accurate. So we don't want to increase the noise too much because then we're not going to get an answer which is close to the reality. Okay? So we still want to have low noise and try to see if we can avoid this attack. So here you could tell that I'm between, let's say, uh, 20 to 40. Okay? Here I had the same example, right? So again, if uh, the three come together, they can find my differentially private uh, inputs. It's the same attack as before. Okay. Yeah, but here it's only at the output, right? So here, if we collude and we learn the, the weight of this party, then yes, yeah, so we have the weight of the user with the differential private noise. So yes, we can still go back to the data if the noise is small. So now I'm going to show you how we can actually do better than that so that without increasing the noise, I'm going to increase the range uh, of my age here. So you would be able to tell that I'm between 0 and 50 or 0 and 60. So without increasing the noise that we put in the whole system, we're able to, like, uh, if we have collusions, the parties that they are colluding, they will still learn my differential private weights, but the noise is going to be larger. But larger without increasing the noise of the system. I'm going to tell you, now it sounds weird, but I'm going to tell you later how this is doable. So this is the idea. We're trying to increase the noise here, so that even if you see the differential private weight, it will be much harder for you to go back to the real data. We're not eliminating it completely, right? Because you're still adding noise, but it will be much harder for you to go back. I will make this more explicit uh, in the next slides. Okay, so here is the, the idea. So basically, we combine uh, secure computation and differential privacy to eliminate this uh, n minus one attacks. I will make this explicit uh, in a while. But before we do that, so before I, I go to explain how we do this, I'm gonna tell you how uh, a previous federated learning protocol works so that you know how things are working. And on top of that, I'm gonna build this uh, new solution that we have here, okay? And here I have like the attack that uh, I was saying before on how we can actually, what is, uh, what we are achieving. Okay, so let's say we have uh, the server here with all the users. And we talked about uh, n minus one collisions, right? So that the server colludes with n minus one uh, parties. So let's say it targets this one party that it needs to learn the weights of this one party. Okay, let's say this is uh, Arpita, so we are all against her. So what the server is going to do, 
So he's going to pick, uh, as we said, in every iteration you pick a new set of clients, right? So what he's going to do, he's going to pick his friends, okay? His malicious friends. He's not going to pick other parties. So he picks only his malicious friends. So we have this n minus 1 attack here, okay? So the goal is that even if this n minus 1 and the server come together, we will not be able to learn the differential private input of this honest party based only on the noise that this party added. Somehow, later in the protocol, I'm going to show you how we are going to add more noise to his output. Okay? And here, if you don't uh, like the setting that the server has to find n minus 1 other parties to collude, then actually what the adversary can do, he can create fake users. Okay? This is a, a big uh, problem that you can have in federated learning. So it's called the uh, Cybill attack. So he can generate n minus one fake accounts and target only one user. Okay, so this is like very uh, very possible to do. So even if he doesn't have like his friends in the system, he can create these fake accounts and attack one particular user. Okay, and you would think, okay, why do I need to create this and this other n minus one parties to attack this user? Why I don't attack this user directly, right? But this user is sending his weights encrypted, so there's no way, even if you attack this single person, because it's encrypted, you cannot go back to his weights. But if you create this n-1, you can immediately find his weights, basically. Okay, so this is to motivate uh, the attack. And the previous work that I'm going to show you now, uh, they are susceptible to these uh, civil attacks. So I'm going to show you now the protocol, this protocol. It was the first protocol that did secure aggregation, it's from some folks at Google. And then I'm going to tell you how we are adding uh, a new mechanism on top of this to avoid this type of attacks here. Okay, so let's go to the protocol. So it's a one run protocol to do secure aggregation. So remember again the setting, we have the different uh, users and they're supposed to compute locally their own weights. And they are supposed to send their encrypted weights to the server and the server is computing on the encrypted weights to get the final uh, average uh, weights. Okay, and then, yeah. So the clients are not going to communicate, but for simplicity here, I'm going to show you first how it's done if they communicate, but we don't want the, the clients to communicate. This is another restriction, okay? So you don't want these mobile devices start talking to each other, okay? That's going to be crazy and you're not going to compute anything if you require the phones to talk to each other, okay? So, yeah. The phones are not going to talk to each other, uh, and I'm going to show you how this is done. So now, as an assumption, assume that these uh, mobile devices, uh, they, they spoke together, and they generated some common random numbers, okay? So the first uh, phone has a common a random number with the, with the second phone. I call it RAB, some random value. Uh, the second with the third, they have some other random value, and the first with the third, some other random value. Okay, so let's assume that before the protocol starts, they already have these uh, common random numbers. And uh, the server doesn't know these values in the middle, okay? So because if the server knows these values, uh, you will see in a second that uh, the whole protocol is going to crash. Okay, so let's see how they encrypt. So suppose that these are their weights that they were supposed to encrypt and send to the server. So how they encrypt? So the first person adds the two random numbers that it has with the other number, okay? And you see where this is going. So the second one is subtracting the value that the other person added, okay? And adding RBC, and the other one is subtracting the random values it has with the other party, okay? So now you can see that uh, the server received all these uh, three different encryptions, and it cannot find the weights because it doesn't know the random values, okay? So everything looks uh, pseudo-random to him. And then if it adds all these values, it basically these R's are getting cancelled out and you get the sum of the weights. Okay? So is this protocol clear? And it's one round protocol. So the parties sent uh, the encryption and then the server without communicating back to them at all, he can compute uh, the final result. And the final result will be unencrypted. Okay? So there's no secret gig going on here. I sent you the encryptions and you can immediately compute uh, the aggregated values. Okay, it's not really aggregation. If you remember, it's weighted average, but you can divide by three, okay? So it's like, let's just focus on aggregation for now. Okay, so this is this super simple protocol. And how these values are generated, these random values, basically you're using Diffie-Hellman key chains, 
and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. I'm going to go super quickly over it. Okay, so the goal is that we want these two devices to generate this common random number. And as I said before, these devices should not talk to each other. So they must do this through uh, the middle server. So let's see how it's done. So we are using like groups and we work modulo P. I assume you know all this stuff. So the first uh, user, it picks some secret A and sends to the server G to the modulo P. Okay, this is his public key. And then the second server picks its own secret B and sends uh, G to the B to the middle server. Okay, so now the server received this value. So what it can do, it can just like forward this message to the other parties, okay? So it just forwards the two public keys. And then what uh, the first user can do, so it received G to the B. It can raise it to the power of A, that it's his secret, and get G to the A B. And the other party received G to the A, so it raises it to the power of B and gets G to the AB. So you see that they both come up with the same number. You need to apply some hashing later, but I'm not going to go to that because here you are not getting uh, all the possibilities. So you see that both of them get the same random number. Okay. And the thing is that uh, the server should not be able to come up with the same number. And why it cannot compute the same number? Because of the discrete log uh, problem, right? So if you see G to the A and G to the B, it's very hard for you to find what is A and what is B if these numbers are very large, okay? So I guess you are familiar with uh, these things. So the server will never be able to find A and B and because it cannot find A and B, it can never be able to compute uh, these random values, okay? So do you have any questions? Is it? Yeah. Yeah, so you could, uh, if this is another server, then like the other server can send different keys. So what it can do, you can have the parties generate a different uh, random number, but still the guy in the middle, he won't be able to know what is this random number because still he cannot guess the A and the B values. But it can like forward different values and then... Yeah, so if he picks, yeah, if he picks his own secret, then he will know, he will be able to generate, let's say he has the value C, his secret is C. So you will be able to generate with this part in G to the AC, okay? And he will stand in the middle. Yeah, he could do that. Yeah. But you can, in the Fihama key exchange, this is what we use uh, online, so you can avoid this type of attacks. I'm not going to tell you now how, but uh, you can do that. Okay. So, and another thing that I said is that uh, the server, uh, sorry, the clients do not talk to each other, right? And here, this randomness that we have here, if we use the same randomness every time that we do an iteration with the federated learning to do the secure aggregation, we cannot use the same randomness because uh, then the protocol will not be secure. But actually what you can do without having extra communication, so you run this once at the beginning, this Diffie-Helma key exchange, you run it once. So you get this uh, common random numbers, and then you can use a pseudo random generator to generate new numbers for the next iteration. Okay, so in that way, you will not need to communicate uh, extra for the next iterations. Okay, if we all use the same seed in the pseudo random generator, we're going to get the same numbers out. Okay, so in the next iteration, so if everybody uses, um, they have like, they agree some, some part of the previous value is going to be the new seed. So if they run uh, on the same seed, they're going to get the same values out. So they're all the same page and they have all the same new random number. And then they can use these new random numbers to send new encryptions. So in that way, you are running the Diffie-Hellman key exchange only once at the beginning. Okay? So this is this secure aggregation protocol that was first introduced for federated learning. Yeah. Yeah, so if, like, let's say this party, instead of adding, subtracting, or does bad things, right? Uh, so you could add some zero knowledge proofs to do that, but also there's also an argument that if you, let's say you are this user and you, d you don't put the values that you were supposed to put, then effectively you are only changing your input. So your input will be different. Yeah, so it will be completely random and effectively you can say that you are changing your input. So there are two different attacks, right? One that you want the system to give out a completely different value. And then in that setting, you will need to use some zero knowledge proof to show that you did the right thing. 
But also what you can do, so if you're trying to do this type of attack, basically you are effectively you're changing your weights. It's like an additive attack, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, the first paper that uh, published this, they did not have that. So they didn't have zero knowledge proof. So it was susceptible to these attacks. Yes, and they don't have zero knowledge proofs. <laughs> and actually, what they do. So let me correct. So they are not using exactly this scheme. So they are using this scheme as the first layer. So the encryption is indeed like this. But then they are changing slightly their protocol to accommodate drop off clients. But if they drop off, then like uh, you have a way to keep going with the protocol. So I'm not going to show you exactly how this protocol works. But there, um, even if you do like uh, this attack here, you will still mess up with everything. But the mess up is slightly uh, less. This mess is, uh, uh, is better than this mess. But still, they are not. Uh, taking care of that. They don't use it in all these groups. Yeah. So in general, and this is an open problem that I also have at the end, malicious security in federated learning is not well explored. So we don't have good malicious systems, apart from using generic uh, malicious secure computation, where you can, of course, you can use it, but it won't be that efficient. So it's not uh, concretely explored for malicious security. Can you uh, speak a little bit louder? If you're also two people colluded the server, you can yes. still learn the third person's way. Exactly, right? yeah. Standalone. So even this protocol that, uh, yeah, so you can completely learn uh, the input of the other party. So this protocol is even susceptible to this attack. Yeah, exactly. Because they will know the values. Okay, so if two share the values, then they can, if they see the messages, they can definitely find the weight of the other person. Yes, yeah, so and this protocol is even susceptible to this attack. And even the final protocol that they have, it's still susceptible to this attack. They don't fix it. <laughs> we need to solve them. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Yeah, you need to, so in this protocol, yes, you need to tell them the index. So the users need to have some index. For example, let's say if I'm sharing this value with uh, the third no, client. but uh, the exchanges happens through the server, right? Yeah, so let's say so, in the beginning we have this 1 million users, right? So uh -huh. we do the exchange for all the 1 million users. And then when we pick only 5,000 or 50 for every iteration, we need to tell them which random values they need to use. I see. Yeah, so you also need to tell them that, yeah. So that's where the collusion is possible. If there was a possibility for the people within the subset to not know who are the elements, then it would... Yeah, but if they don't know, then this protocol fails completely. So, yeah. So you have one million users to do a key exchange between each other? Yeah, you will need to do this for one million users, correct. <laughs> but they don't actually do this. Right? What do you mean? No, they do it through the server, yeah. Okay. There's a way to do it like, uh, so here you will need to have a key, a, a common key with this other 1 million users, okay? What you can do, you can do like log and uh, connections, right? So you can do a tree of connections, but I'm not sure if at Google they implemented this. I'm not sure if they do the more efficient version or if they do the N-squared uh, solution, I'm not sure what they're doing, yeah. Okay, so this is their basic protocol. So now I'm going to tell you um, the, the different uh, mechanisms that uh, we can have to like avoid this n minus one attacks. Okay. So just to note here, so in this protocol, what you can also do, uh, they can also add noise. Okay. So they can just like when they send uh, these encryptions, they can add some noise at the end so that the final answer is differentiated private. Okay. So they can also do that. Okay. So there are two ways uh, to add noise. So in the first one, you are adding noise at the input level. So let's say you're doing your local uh, machine learning computation. 
So you're adding the noise to your inputs directly and then you learn the training, okay? And then there's another setting where you're adding the noise after you finish with the training, okay? So the second one is better because you are adding the noise at the end, so the noise doesn't accumulate if you add it at the beginning. So you will can have you can have less noise if you add it at the end, okay? But there are also some works that uh, what they do, so they leave the server in the middle uh, decide the noise, okay? So some works, they are, they are saying that uh, they're sending the weights to the server and the server adds the noise. But then you need to trust the server that he's going to add the noise, okay? So there are also these settings that they're out there. But we don't want to do that. So we're going to follow this, the second approach, that the parties, they are generating uh, their local model and then they add the noise. They added the final weights, okay? So let's see. So this is the, in the existing approach. What's happening is that, uh, so let's say I'm doing only for one weight, okay? So these parameters can be many. So based, let's say if it's a logistic regression, you're gonna have like, I don't know, 30 weights, okay? So, but I'm doing it for one weight, just to simplify everything. So let's say these are the W1, W2, and W3 are the local trained weights that the parties received after they run the training, okay? So what they do, so basically they encrypt their weights using, for example, the method that I showed you before, this secure aggregation, okay? So that think that the lock means that you are using some encryption. And then they are adding some noise, usually from the Laplace distribution. So there are many different distributions and they're differentially private. So based on the different problem, you need to pick some different distribution. So here, uh, what they do, uh, the Google paper, they use like Laplace. I think there's also an argument where you can use also Gaussian, Gaussian noise, but we're focusing on Laplace here in the, on this particular slide. So they have different trade-offs, so you need to like test the trade-offs before you decide. So they basically add the noise and then the server gets all the noise. Uh, and then let's see what happens uh, when we have the collusion. So if uh, the first two parties come together, they can actually, and they see the final output, right? The aggregated value. Uh, again, here, the server computes the weighted average, but they simplify everything, showing your aggregations, okay? It's the same thing. So if the two parties come together, so this is the final output, right? Because you are adding all of this, the encryption goes away. I showed you before how this can be done. So you are end up with this result, and everybody sees this result. So let's say these two collude. So they can subtract uh, their weights and their noise. So you end up with the noise of the third person, the input of the third person, and the noise of the third person, right? So this is uh, the leakage that you have. Okay? Uh, so now, uh, let's see uh, if we can improve this attack. So let's say now, uh, again, assume here that there's some communication between uh, the clients, but we can uh, remove this communication. Okay? but assume that there's some communication. So now let's say that uh, I receive the noise that I'm adding to my input from the other parties, okay? So before, I was using my own noise and I was adding my noise to my input, okay? So now let's say that I'm receiving it from the other parties. So let's say here, party one sends uh, a noise to the second uh, party and this party sends some other noise to this party. Okay, and it's encrypted. So they are sending an encryption of some noisy term that I'm not able to see. Okay, so let's say I repeat you're sending me some noise, it's encrypted, and I'm adding it to my input. Okay, so I don't know now how much noise I have added to my input. So what can happen now? So let's say the two parties come together. Okay, so the, this is the final output. Okay, so basically here, we are adding all the noise that the parties exchange, right? So, the two parties come together, they can subtract uh, their inputs and these noisy terms, okay? So what you end up with here is again, so you end up with the noise of the third person and the noise is that it chose to send to the other two parties, right? So 3-1 was the noise that uh, it sends to the first party. The first party couldn't like subtract it because it didn't know what it added to its input. And 3-2 and was the noise that party 3 sent to party uh, 2. And again, the party two couldn't remove it because it didn't know the noise, okay? But we didn't gain much here, right? Because we are still left with the noise uh, of the third party, okay? So we didn't gain much here. 
So I didn't know how much noise I added to my input, but still, I'm able to subtract the noise that I sent to the other parties, okay? So I didn't achieve much here. But what we can do, we can actually uh, do uh, another trick, which is actually very easy to see. So basically what you do, so I'm sending to Arpita, let, let's simplify here, two uh, noise vectors encrypted, okay? And she's choosing one, one of them. And I don't know which one she chose, okay? So let's see here. So party one sends to party two, two different noise, noisy terms encrypted. And this party sent other two noisy terms, okay? So now let's see. So the first party is going to add uh, one of the two, okay? So let's say it picked the N211. Okay, so it's adding only the second one. It's not adding the first one. Okay, and from here, it received the N31 and N31, the zero and the one, and it picks uh, again the, the second one. Okay, so it picks one of the two. It doesn't like uh, pick both. Okay, so now, uh, if the two parties come together, they cannot subtract anything. Because now they don't know, like, I don't know how much noise I added to my input. And also the person that sent me the noise also doesn't know what noise I chose. Okay? So basically you can abstract all this out and say that you can apply secure computation where the inputs of the parties are also some noisy terms and they're added to the other parties. So that the other parties don't know how much noise is going to be added to their input. And the party that uh, puts the inputs to the system should also not know what noise the other party chose. Okay? So you could use, ah, yeah. Yeah, so this is malicious behavior. And you can add some uh, range, some uh, zero knowledge uh, range proofs to like check if they are the same. So you will need to use some type of zero knowledge. It's like weaker zero knowledge, but you will have to use because the, he can pick the same noise or he can pick the zero noise, okay? So he can do all this uh, type of things, okay? So here is the idea. So basically, you don't know how much noise uh, is being added. So you have no idea and you cannot subtract. So now uh, you can understand what I was saying before when I was saying that when n minus 1 come together, they can see the differential private input of the honest party. But here they don't see the differential private input of that party plus the noise that that party added. There's a lot of noise. So now, let's say if in the previous papers, uh, I could guess that uh, my age is between like 20 and 40. With this approach, on average, I would like see that my age is between 0 and 70. Okay, so I'm hiding much more. And the idea here is that I did not add more noise to the system. Okay, because remember what I told you at the beginning? In differential privacy, if you increase the size of the noise, you are achieving less accuracy. But here, I did not increase the noise at all. Okay. So I just created uh, a system where the parties were not able to subtract the noise. Okay, so with the same noise level as in previous works, we can leak much less. Okay, so this is the main idea here. And what noise we're using? So as I said before, so it's better to add the noise uh, after you do the local training. But there's also another setting where uh, the noise that you are adding is not completely differential private. So let's say when I'm sending my encryption here, I still add noise, but I'm not adding differential private noise. And only if all, if all these uh, values come from all the different servers, only then when the noise is added becomes differential private. This is even better than adding noise at the end of your computation. Okay, so basically what we're doing, so there's a theorem that says that uh, the sum of differences of gamma distributions, it's a Laplace distribution, okay? So Laplace distribution is differential private. And so basically what we do, so the noise that the parties choose, it's uh, the difference of two gamma distributions, which is not differential private, private yet, okay? So everybody is choosing noise from the difference of two gamma distributions. And only when they come in the middle surfer, he adds them up, and only then they become differential private. Okay, so this is the type of noise that we're using. So even with that, you can have a better accuracy. Okay? Yeah. So, if you want to find things for you, and they are the other part of things, you put plus this distribution that you're introduced, which is 
Yeah, so basically this is the input of the third party and all of this. So yeah, they can, so the distributions actually, they are known. And these are like... Uh, Go back, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. So now the noise is much bigger than the one that you would get uh, with the previous methods because with the previous methods you have the weight plus some noise. So this noise that you had before it's much smaller than this noise here. But again, the noise in the system is exactly the same as in the previous systems. Okay. So now you cannot. Uh, you are seeing the weight again from the other party. But the noise is larger, so now to like. No, it's not private noise, right? no, it is. It is differential private noise. So this is like a uh, thing that these are all uh, differential private noises. So basically, the idea is the following. So again, here you are seeing the weight with some noise. Okay. So with previous approaches, you were still able to see the weight plus some noise, but the noise there it was much smaller. So it was much easier to launch this, uh, these attacks to go back to the training data. So here, the noise, the magnitude of noise, it's much higher. So in that way, it's much harder for you to go back to the training data. And the idea here is when I say that the noise here is much larger, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're adding more noise to the system. It's just that the part is they cannot subtract the noise. Okay, I'm not adding more noise. So that's the idea. Is it clear? Uh, sorry, there's. Actually, I don't hear you. I'm saying uh, it's not just to the due to the bigger noise. Probably the theorem that you mentioned also helps in adding to the differential privacy here because a lot of one out of two gamma noises they add to this Laplacian distribution, which is yes. So problem. yeah. So basically, to prove our theorem, what you have to do, so you can start guessing this, right? So I sent you like two noises, and you pick one of them, right? So I can start guessing which one you chose, and I can start like uh, trying to subtract what you added. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you start doing this argument, the probability of finding what are the exact values that uh, they are here, it goes uh, down to negligible to find them out. And even like if you said, so here I said one out of two, okay? So it becomes even harder if it's one out of n, where n is some uh, large constant as well. Okay. So then you could actually start guessing what are the noise and you can start subtracting. And also actually what you can do, you can uh, subtract the average, okay? Mm -hmm. Because you know these uh, distributions. Right. So you can subtract the average if you want. But mm -hmm. still, even if you subtract the average, still you are not getting close to what is being done here okay and i think n grows as the number of parties decrease to balance for these things uh, you mean this n? yeah yeah the one out of n yeah it has to grow with respect to if the number of parties decrease right for the differential privacy noise to hold yeah so the laplace noise that we're using is inverse proportional to the number of parties so the more parties that you have uh, the better noise uh, that you have yeah exactly Yes. Basically, uh, the entrance that you're using is the secure aggregation protocol that you mentioned, right? Yeah, for this one that I'm showing you here, yes. But that itself was susceptible to collusion of n minus one. Yeah. So one thing that I did not. So here we are not susceptible to this attack because of the following reason. So I did not tell you how we are encrypting the noise. Okay. So a simple way of thinking of how you are encrypting the noise is using one-time pad. So basically, let's say this guy sent to this guy, let's say it sent N12. So let's say we use some pad, uh, let's call it S. So I'm sending to you S plus N12, the noise, okay? S plus the noise. I'm sending you this. And now when I'm sending my results to the server, I need to subtract this S, okay? So that when the server gets them, the noise is, uh, the S's are getting canceled. So now if this N minus one part has come together, they, are, they don't know my S, so they cannot subtract it. So there's no way, so we are not susceptible to the same attack as before. Okay? Okay, so actually, since you asked this question, uh, so the simpler version is to use one-time pads to encrypt the noise. But you can also use like uh, oblivious transfer and use uh, even like uh, pre-processing for the oblivious transfer. And you can even use this silent OT that I think one of you is going to talk about it, right? This you, Peter? 
Yeah. So you can also use these things. So this is great, but this is when the parties are not dropping off. Okay. So let's say if a party drops off, let's say uh, Arpita sent me her noise. I added one of the two noises that she sent me, but then she doesn't come back uh, to like give her one time path to decrypt the noise. Okay, then we are stuck. So this protocol is good when the parties don't drop off, but if they drop off, then it doesn't work. So in the next slides, I have a high level how the protocol can work for drop off parties. I'm gonna give you only high level, I'm not gonna give you details, but actually uh, before I go to that, so here remember that I told you uh, that there are like two approaches, so let's so here I have an example. So let's say, uh, let me recall, so we have like a, two diff uh, a set of uh, students and either they passed the exam or they didn't pass the exam or they admitted somewhere, I don't remember the exact set, Vike did it, okay? So we have this data set. Uh, so if we like do the classification, so the, um, the green one is uh, the classifier that we don't use any encryption or any difference in privacy. Okay, so this is the classifier that we can get, the green one. And remember I told you we can add noise after we do the local training or which is actually uh, the orange one. Okay. Or we can add, uh, the noise that you are adding is not differential private and only when it goes to the server and it aggregates, it becomes differential private. So you can see the difference in accuracy here. So uh, the black one is the second one where only when it goes to the server and it's being accumulated, it becomes differential private. Uh, so you can see that the black one is very close to the green one. So you can see that you are definitely saving a lot in accuracy if you're using this approach. Okay. Ah, and another thing that I want to mention here, so I told you about the N-1 attack and it's actually realistic because either the server can generate fake users with this uh, cyber attack or it can talk to its friends. But also uh, there's uh, an attack that you can do for N-2 users. Okay, so why is this relevant for N-2? So when the data is not uh, identically distributed, so if you do the n minus two uh, attack, then you can find the sum of the two of the weights of the two parties <coughs> plus some noise, right? So now you are learning the sum of the two parties. So if the data is not identically distributed, maybe you can leak that these two users, they have, their distribution is much lower than the distribution of the other parties. So you can leak uh, which parties have like, I don't know, let's say that we have some distributions with some variants then we can maybe like see that the variance of these users is completely different from the variance of some other users, okay? So you can also do this type of thing. So it, this can go to n-2 attack, n-3, n-4, so you target uh, your users and you're trying to find out what's going on with their distributions, okay? And you need to repeat this many times to find the distribution of these uh, two players, but anyway, we're in federated learning settings, so you can run this many times to find the distribution of the inputs of this uh, on these parties, okay? So you can either do n minus one attack or n minus two, n minus three, you name it, okay? So I have like, uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes? More? Okay. Okay. I don't think I have slides for 20 minutes, but okay. Um, so let's see uh, how we can do things when the parties drop off. Uh, so what we can do, so let's go back to the secret sharing example. So if these parties uh, secret share their input, so let's say these are the weights of the parties, okay? And we are secret sharing our weights, but as I said before, we cannot send our weights uh, to the other parties uh, because we don't want to communicate with them, okay? And if I send all my shares to the server, I mean, the server sees all the shares, you can add them up and find my weights, okay? So this doesn't work. So what you can do, you can use additive homomorphic encryption, okay? So what you can do, um, so let's say every party has its own public key. So party one has public key one, uh, party two has public key two, party three has public key three, okay? So... <clears throat> Basically what the party does, it encrypts uh, the different shares using uh, the public key of the respective party, okay? 
So it sends the second share to the second party encrypted under the second party's keys and so on. Okay? The second party does the same. Uh, actually, they send them to the server. Okay? I was wrong before. So it encrypts all the shares based on the different public keys of the different parties and sends them all to the server. Okay? Four different encryptions. The second party does the same. So it encrypts all its shares based on the different public keys of all the parties. So everybody does that. So now the server has all these different encryptions. Okay, and this encryption, let's say it's additively homomorphic. So if we add two ciphertexts, we're going to get the addition uh, of the two uh, ciphertexts, right? So what the server can do, um, it can add all the encryptions for the first share, like all the encryptions that they are under the public key of the first party. Okay, so they do uh, the same thing. So the server does four uh, different additions. So it comes up with an encryption of M1, an encryption of M2, an encryption of M3, and an encryption of M4. Okay, but they're encrypted. So here, because we're using additive homomorphic encryption, the server doesn't have the key. So it's not like before. Before it was a one round protocol. So the parties were sending the encryptions and then immediately we were able to compute the sum. So here we cannot do it immediately because now we need to decrypt, right? So basically what the server does, it sends uh, these different uh, four ciphertexts back to the parties and they are decrypting, okay? So then it receives them in the clear. And then if you sum them up, you are getting uh, the sum of the salaries. But the idea here is like uh, to have some threshold, right? So the threshold here, so let's say we're using some mere secret sharing. So even if let's say, uh, so here the number of parties is small, but let's say even if three parties uh, were online to like decrypt, or even if three parties sent us their uh, ciphertext here, so we can use these three different shares and from the three different shares, we can actually compute the final result. So if our threshold uh, is, uh, I don't know, let's increase the number. So if the threshold is like 50, the privacy threshold is 50, and we have 100 parties. So if this 100 parties don't come online, then it's okay, we can keep going. But uh, if like uh, uh, 51 come, we are still okay, right? But if like 49 come, then we still don't have 50 to recover. Okay, so here it really depends on how many priorities are coming online. So this is the high level on how you can do this. So this is a two-round protocol. So if you look at the Google paper, they're accommodating drop of parties, not using additive homomorphic encryption. They're using the previous method that I showed you before. And if a party doesn't show up, basically what they do, they are trying to reconstruct this common randomness that uh, that party has and they don't know, so that they subtract it. But that's not enough, so they are still using secret sharing to recover everything. But actually, uh, they also have some other issue there using that. So let's say some party did not answer in their protocol, and they waited for some time and did not answer. And then they are trying to recover the random values that it added, these common random values. But let's say if this party, after one second, comes back, Okay, so then if this partner in, does send the message at the end, and if we already recovered his random values, then we can uh, reveal the input of that party. So they need to add some other round to also like uh, not leak this information even if the party comes back. So overall, their protocol is four rounds. Okay, and they are not using this additive form of encryption. And you could think that okay, if you use additive form of encryption, you need to do some exponentiations. So you would expect that it won't be that efficient because uh, in the previous protocol that I showed you, it's just addition and subtraction, right? It's not, uh, there's only exponentiation in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, but this happens once at the beginning. So you would imagine that this pro that protocol is more efficient, but actually the fact that it's uh, four rounds instead of two, even if here we need to do a lot of exponentiations, then it's still more efficient than the four rounds, okay? Uh, but so this protocol is very simple. It's not like rocket science. It's like you're just getting the shares, you are encrypting the shares using additive form of encryption, and then you are getting the answer, right? It's super simple. Uh, what we are doing, actually, we still want to avoid additive form of encryption. We still want to avoid these exponentiations. And we're doing something else. Uh, I don't have slide for that. 
But basically, you could think that instead of uh, encryptions, we have yet another level of SARS. So we have a way to use uh, like SARS. So you're still sending. Uh, so here you were sending uh, the number of encryption was proportional to the number of parties, right? So you had n parties, you had to send n uh, different uh, ciphertexts. So in our case, we are adding a sharing on top of the sharing. So basically you are encrypting your sharing based on another sharing. You are still sending n things to the parties, uh, but you're still able to achieve these properties. And we have a way where you can refresh the shares without extra communication. Okay, so I don't have slides for that. If you're interested, I can tell you offline about this protocol. And our protocol is still two rounds. So we're using only secret sharing uh, and only additions and multiplications. Uh, sorry, addition and subtractions. We don't use exponentiation. We don't use additive form of encryption. Okay, and here, another thing that we have to do, as I told you before, so remember how we generate the noise. So you are receiving encrypted noise from the other parties. So if these parties don't show up, then you still have an issue because you don't know what noise you need to add from what party, then it becomes complicated. But also we are using secret sharing for the noise. So you're still able to do all of these things in the same fashion. And at the end, you end up with a two-round protocol. Okay? So now I want to tell you uh, about this simulation environment. So as I said before, so, okay, we build our protocol. But now we need to like run it, to run some experiments. Um, and I told you that there's a, there are all these systems that I showed you in the first slide for federated learning, but you cannot really like play with them and simulate many instances. So we have this Abide simulation, and actually, interestingly enough, the simulation was used for simulating financial markets. So my co-authors they were using it uh, to like simulate a stock exchange. So now we turn it to a secure Abytes uh, version where we can uh, we take care of all the requirements that uh, you need for cryptographic protocols. And we are actually, the new property here is that you can actually set in the system where you want uh, the mobile devices to be and what you want like the latency to be between the parties. So you can actually set the latency for phones to be, I don't know, in Australia, like whatever you want. So, and you can have like many users, like you can simulate up to 1 million users if you want to. So you can check it out. Um, so I'm going to conclude now. If you have more questions, uh, I can take them at the end. So let me tell you uh, uh, what I spoke about. So I show you how uh, federated learning works today and how we can avoid this uh, uh, Sybil attacks when we have this N minus one collusion. And also, so our current system, so we implemented it for logistic regression. Uh, think that the parties compute some logistic regression and then like they send their weights to the server and the server aggregates. But you can basically also do it for uh, LSTMs, okay, for neural nets. It's the same idea, okay? So you're training your neural net locally and you get the weights on the neural net. You're sending your weights and the weights is, are get, uh, still getting aggregated, okay? So it's not uh, so any model that uh, requires this aggregation. So we can also do any type of model. For our experiments, we did the uh, logistic regression, but you can do whatever you want. Okay, and most of these models for federated learning, they are indeed reducing to uh, secure aggregation. Okay, and also we have this new simulation environment where you can play and like test your federated learning uh, systems and all of this stuff. And some open problems. So first of all, it's malicious security, as uh, we mentioned before. So none of these papers really like talks about malicious security. So and there are many open problems and many different attacks that can happen when you have malicious security. Uh, and another thing is that uh, many works they are also like uh, building new systems, but they don't have drop of clients as well. Uh, and another thing is what if a party joins in the middle of the protocol? Okay, so let's say that uh, I'm the server, I chose like some set of clients and they only answer in the first round, but in the second round, uh, they didn't come. So this is the drop off that I showed you. But let's say the opposite happens. He did not talk in the first round, but he came in the second round. So then we need also to accommodate this step. We also want him to provide input to the computation, to provide his encrypted weight. So it shouldn't be too late for him to provide the inputs. Okay. 
And with that, I uh, will conclude. Do you have more questions? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, the model, the central model that you have, uh, does it ever get downloaded in the individual mobiles? And what do you mean if it, uh, it's ever getting downloaded? Do the, the clients, do they download the, the server's uh, model? You mean about the central, the, the central model? The code or the model? The model. Yes, yeah, so as I said here, let me go back. Actually, it's, this is too far at the back. Let me... Where is it? Yeah, here. So I did not talk too much about it. So when the server computes this aggregated uh, uh, weight, uh, weights, which is basically the weighted average, then it sends the model back to the to the mobile phone. So that the mobile phones download these new updated values. So there are two things that you can do with them. Okay. So one is that you keep training your model on your new data as they come, and you are comparing your weights to the weights that you received from the global model. And based on the difference, you can see when you will converge. Okay, you can do this thing. There's another method where actually when you retrain your model, you're using these weights, the new weights. So you are, directly, you are directly doing this on the gradients. So this is another approach. And there are pros and cons on the different approaches. So it seems that the one where you are getting the weights and you are comparing uh, converges faster than uh, doing this on than deploying the weights and retrain on the new weights. But then, uh, yeah. So there's some different rate offs and you can, there are many papers that they compare the two. But then uh, you, you don't care about the privacy of the model. Yeah, so okay. here you're seeing uh, the weights in the clear. So basically in our case, you're seeing the weights in the clear with some noise. So yeah, so we're not hiding the, the model completely. It's only differentially private. It's not secure. So if you want to do that, it will actually you can do this. Uh, if, uh, for example, for the drop-off parties, remember that I told you that it's a two-round protocol where you need to talk back to the parties to get the aggregated values. So you can also play with the model such that only the parties are able to decrypt, and they never send the decrypted information to the server. So in that way, you are hiding the model from the server. But hiding it from the users is very hard. Because and that's what I yeah agree. because they will need either to compare their weights to these weights you can do it cryptographically this comparison but comparison is expensive cryptographically or if you want to use the weights then you will need to use the encrypted weights and then you need to put it on your model and usually your model will have multiplications and more crazy things so you cannot really like start uh, training with encrypted weights I mean you can but it will be uh, much less efficient especially for a phone yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that later. So, are there more questions? Okay. Yeah, if somebody has more questions, yeah, they can find me offline. Yeah. Okay, so then with that, we uh, conclude this session. And just to clarify, I don't smoke. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, yeah, so there is a small gift for you. Oh. Thank you.